So, if, if you have not been here for the past couple weeks, again, you're trying to figure out where am I, what's going on, we have named this series Dinosaurs and Robots, The Epic Adventure. Why? Because we wanted to talk about dinosaurs and robots, and somehow we got to fit that into church. No, actually, there's a bigger plan to this. The fact is that there is a story. Do you guys know what this is? Bible. Yeah, oh my gosh. Candy already. All right. This is the Bible. And there's a story. At the beginning, week one, Dan, Pastor uh, uh, Elder Dan, uh, delivered an incredible message on creation. We talked a lot about dinosaurs, and he wowed us. And if you want to know, Teddy, did you miss out? Here you go, Teddy. There you go, buddy. Video? Oh, time out. There's more. Do you guys see the dinosaur and the robot running around? Yeah. Up on stage? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you say yes. Okay, we shot home video footage of them playing together this week. So I want you to watch the screen and check this out. See, sometimes dinosaurs and robots do not get along, right? And so Jesus has to come in and solve all of the problems and make everything great. And really, that's what we're kind of talking about with this story out of the Bible. You guys already got candy for this. This story about the Bible, right? So Dan talked to us. He wowed us with facts about dinosaurs and creation and how God had a plan and did everything. And then Alex last week talked to us about robots and the end times and how we're living in part of those end times. And we have a role in that. And, and a great challenge. And this morning we are talking about Jesus. Now before we jump into things, I want to ask you, how many of you kids would like to find a hidden treasure? Me. Yeah, you'd like to find a hidden treasure? Have you ever found a hidden treasure? Yeah. Adults, anybody found a hidden treasure? Yeah. Kids? Gold? Yeah? yeah. yeah? What'd you find? A two million year old stingray tooth here in Colorado? Huh. Okay, so <laughs> hidden treasures. We're going to talk about a hidden treasure here in a little bit. This mysterious treasure that actually is found in the scriptures. You may not know this already, but I want to ask a question. This is for the kids and for the adults. What does Christianity have to offer? You kids first. What does Christianity have to offer? You guys know what Christianity is? No? Perfect. That's why we are here. All right, so Christianity is believing and following Jesus, going to church, surrendering your life to Him, to him letting Him lead you. Adults, what is Christ? Oh, tell me. So we can learn about God? That'll always work. Here you go. All right, what else? What does Christianity have to offer? What's that? New beginning? Health? Forgiveness? What else? What? Christ. Christ. Grace. Love. love. Absolutely love. So what did you say? Who said that? All right. Some of these are gobstoppers, so watch. It's like the baseball stadium. That's why they're putting up nets, right? All right. So you got to like keep an eye. So here's what some people will say, health, wellness, success, peace of mind, a better job, a better career, a bigger house, your dreams and ambitions, everything you've ever wanted can be found in being a Christian. That would be a fairly common thought for some people, right? In addition, people might say that really what Christianity offers is everything you want. You want an everlasting gobstopper? You want chocolate for life? You want to just drown yourself in mac and cheese? That is everything Christianity has to offer. If you want it, you get it. Some people would say that's what Christianity is, but that would be a very confusing prosperity message and a very false gospel message. What, that would be what? It would be true? Okay, we'll continue to unpack that. What this does when we ask the question to you all and you all is watching online and you kids, what this does is it makes a very simple question very complex. 
Because I think if, if someone were to come to you all, adults and older kids or adults that want to still be a kid, and, and you had a coworker or a neighbor or a friend come to you and say, hey, what does Christianity have to offer me? For a lot of us, we would be stumped. We would have a hard time describing, why should I be a Christian? Okay, once we get past like the eternity standpoint, why? What, what, what does the Bible offer me? What does the gospel offer me? What does Jesus offer me? And so we would struggle with that. And the answer to this question is the same answer that is found in page after page after page of this book that you guys already properly named the Bible. And that is one word, Jesus Christ. Some of you in the crowd said it, some of you kids said it, and it's absolutely true that Jesus Christ, it's what Christianity offers, and it's the entire story. It's why we're here. It's why we jump around. It's why we put on dinosaur outfits and and robot outfits and throw out candy to you and love you and encourage you and support you kids because it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the surpassing theme in the Old and the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, kids or adults, if you're new to the Bible, there's an Old Testament that is the beginning pages, kind of the first part of the Bible. And then there's the New Testament. And all throughout both the Old and the New Testament, they tell us that not having Jesus means you have nothing. But having Jesus means you have everything. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit so that you understand what is Jesus. The Bible says, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. We've been encouraging, bring your Bibles, uh, bring your paper Bibles. If you don't own one, we'll buy you one. If you don't own one and you want one temporarily, take the Bible in the seat in front of you. But we really want to open our Bibles and take notes throughout. Open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And we're going to be jumping around. There's an awful lot of verses, kids. And so what I did is I made sure that all of the Scripture passages, because you guys don't have Bibles sitting down here, all of the passages that we talk about are going to be on the screen so you guys can follow those. And here's a hint. I'm going to be asking questions about those Scriptures, and you might get candy thrown at your head. All right, here we go. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, by his doing, by whose doing? God, right. By God's doing, you are in Christ. You became to us wisdom from God. And here's a bunch of ands. And righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, sometimes we can just read those words and we can just move beyond it. You kids could read those, but guess what? So can your parents. Sometimes we as adults, we read the scriptures and we just move right on unless it's blatantly obvious. But I want to unpack what this actually means for you. Here's what it means. This is truly remarkable. All wisdom, the scriptures say, that is all the benefits that come with wisdom, divine wisdom, all righteousness and the benefits of righteousness All sanctification, that is the the pursuit of holiness and the attainment of holiness. All redemption, including not just our souls being redeemed someday, but our bodies being redeemed. All of that, everything found in who? Yes, Jesus. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. All of that is found in Jesus. What that means for us in this room is as we live in a culture that's constantly looking, looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for peace, looking for understanding, looking for answers, it's found all of it in Jesus. And you kids might know this better than even adults. We live in a place where people just want answers. And they want to know what a two-year-old wants to know. Why? Why? Why should I be a Christian? As you guys get older and you get into middle school and high school and you get taller and and more beautiful hair and stronger and faster, you're going to have friends that want to go, why Jesus? Why all of this? Some of you work with people day in and day out. You have friends, you have neighbors that are wanting, wanting to know why. Why Christianity? What does it have to offer? 
The Bible tells us in Ephesians, not far from 1 Corinthians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, we read, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Now, I want you to, to look at this, kids. How many of the spiritual blessings? Some of them, a few of them, one of them? A lot. A lot. How many? Every, endless. There, there are Tootsie Rolls for everybody, okay? Every spiritual blessing. Okay, this is like 4th of July parade. Every blessing that comes. No wonder then that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 said, I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. We live in a day where we want to know all of the answers about everything. Every political button that comes up, we want an answer. Every uh, uh, cultural situation that comes up, we want an answer. The Apostle Paul said, all I want to know is Jesus. Because if I can know Jesus, I will know everything. Now, does that mean you're going to be the most brilliant person on the planet? No, no, it's not going to mean you're the most brilliant. Does that mean you're going to get straight A's? No, maybe, but not because of that. Does that mean you're going to have the best job and, and be the wisest person on the planet? No, no it's not going to work that way. But it will be that it says you will have every spiritual blessing that comes from the heavens. Not some, not one, not just a few. Everything. And we're going to understand exactly what that means. That is our foundational message, is that Christ is Christianity. He is the one that ties everything together. Pastor Alex talked about this last week, that he is literally what holds the two ends together. And everything in between, the beginning and the end, and everything in the middle, he's all that we need. As Christians, we have only one message. We have one message, and that is Jesus Christ. What we do is we tell unsaved sinners. Now, this isn't very politically correct. This isn't culturally norm because no one wants to be told what to do and how to live life. Certainly, no one wants to be told how they're in the wrong. You all understand that. But as Christians, what we do is we live a life, the Bible tells us that we have been given, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And the ministry of reconciliation begins with telling an unsaved world that they are sinners in need of a great Savior. That's what we do. That's who we are. That they can have a relationship with Christ. And in that relationship, they will receive everything that they need. Every spiritual blessing. That means life starts to make sense. Does that mean life just gets better and better and better and nothing bad happens? In no way. But there's a hope. There's a foundation. Some of you can still remember saying yes, Lord, to that first time when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the foundation that it gave you. You remember being baptized in the McGovern's pool. You remember that hope. That's what is offered in every spiritual blessing. And yet, in the name of Christianity, in the name of the church, in the name of the gospel, in the name of trying to relate to culture and be seeker-friendly, somehow, in the midst of all that, people are told all kinds of things. They're promised all kinds of things. That, hey, if you just accept Christ, here's what's going to happen. Promises that are nowhere found in the Scriptures. And somewhere in the middle of it all, if recognizable at all, is a very weakened Jesus. Rather than finding all of Jesus. And I want to talk to you kids for a second. Look up here. Thank you. You're so polite and respectful and smart. Anything that reduces Jesus is wrong. Anything that puts Jesus as second fiddle, anything that reduces Jesus to being an and some is a wrong gospel. It's a false gospel. Uh, some of you middle school and high school students, some of you adults, 
as you grow up and, and you, you maybe move away and you find another church or you're church shopping or you're looking, anything that you go to, any church that you go to that reduces Jesus in any way possible, you need to turn around and run. Especially for you students. Because what will be pushed upon you is philosophy and science and manners and relationships and everything else. And Jesus will be one of many, if there at all. And that is a false gospel. And this is happening today. It's happening in our culture. It's happening in churches. It's happening in friendships. It's happening all around us where Jesus is being diminished to part of the story rather than the story. But you see, we're not alone. How are you doing there, Teddy? You're sad? Perfect. Here's some more candy. There you go, buddy. That's how you parent right there, Alex. Any other parent pro-bribery? Peace. Okay. All right, so there's a book in the Bible, kids, called Colossians. Can you say that word? Colossians. Colossians. Say it louder. Colossians. Colossians. Say it like you say Miranda. Colossians. All right, good. Colossians. All right. So there's this book in the Bible called Colossians. And apparently, the people in this town of Colossae, that, where the book of Colossians was written, they were told that they need more than Jesus, that he wasn't enough, that there was some kind of... Uh, insufficiency with him. And so the culture started adding a whole lot of philosophy uh, to the message of Jesus. And so Paul, the apostle Paul, begins to write these words to, to, to counter this idea that Jesus needs to be supplemented. Notice at the beginning, it'll be on the screen, kids, Colossians chapter 1, it says, His beloved Son, which becomes the foundation for verse 14, His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And who is He? Jesus, absolutely. In Him, in He, He has loved us. He is the beloved Son. In Jesus, we have the forgiveness of sins. It goes on to say, He is the image of the invisible God. The proto-tokos. Can you guys say that? Proto-tokos. Say it one more time. You guys know Greek. You're amazing. You're Greek scholars. And the proto-tokos is the premier one of all creation. He is the first. He is the first one. He is the premier. He is the dominant one of all of creation, Scripture says. It goes on to say, by him all things were created, both in the heaven and on earth. This is wild, you guys. Listen, it says, by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth. What does that include? Yes! What else? Animals. What kind of animals? You guys notice that little slip? Dinosaurs. Brilliant. What else? Unicorns. Yes. Absolutely unicorns. Robots. Oh my gosh. Yes. Every animal. Now what's in heaven? Dead souls. <laughs> Come here real quick. This is my preaching partner right here. Like this guy right here. Polite, respectful, understanding. Dead souls. You're the man. High five. Seriously, you are the man. All right, get down. Dead souls. You don't get candy for that one, but it's super fun to hear it. Dead souls. What else is in heaven? Jesus and God, both of them. What? Angels. Do you guys? Angels. Do you guys believe in angels? Yeah. Adults, you all believe in angels? In Him, the Bible says, in the heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That might include unicorns. Yay, Yay Miranda. So all of those things, and now it gets even better, you guys. Are you ready? 
in the heavens and on the earth, here's what it says, whether thrones or dominion or rulers, speaking of angelic beings, all things created by Him. Who's Him? Jesus, yes, by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. When you think the world is going to a bad place and we should start worrying and being scared and worrying that the best is behind us, guess who's holding it all together? Yes. Jesus is more than just someone who comes in to make us feel good. He holds all of this together. And listen to what else it says. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the premier one, ever raised from the dead, so that he himself might come to have the first place in some things. Does it say in some things, adults? In everything. He comes so that he can take first place in everything. In your work, in your relationships, in your finances, in your calendar, in your marriage, He comes to take first place. Not one among many, not a seat at the table. He comes to take first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure to have all the fullness dwell in Him. And what fullness? The fullness of God. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus and Jesus, the Bible says, takes up residency. That means He lives in you, which means you house the fullness of God. The same God, if we were to rip up all this screen and, the, and the, the window covers and you were to see the mountains and the rivers and the birds and the flowers and the sun and we still have snow on some of our mountains, that the fullness of the God who made all of that dwells and lives in you. And the Bible says that this fullness of God was from before creation. That means before the dinosaurs. And after the end times, when the robots stop working. The Bible says, listen to this. How many of you guys love Earth? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, you like Earth? The Bible says that God is going to come when Jesus comes again, and He's going to create a brand new heaven and a brand new Earth. It gets better than that. The Bible says that those who believe in Jesus Christ, he is going to look at you and he is going to say, your name is no longer fill in the blank. He's going to give you a brand new name that only you and God know. That's how special you are. That's how incredible God is. And here's the hidden treasure. You guys ready for the hidden treasure? The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, verse 2 ends referring to Christ. And then in verse 3, it says, In Christ, in whom all are hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then verse 9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Verse 10, in him you have been made complete. Uh, friends, I'm going to talk to adults for a moment. Can you guys hold on? Yeah. Adults, you are made complete. You are not less than. We live in a culture with depression and anxiety where men and women are growing up and, and you think you are less than. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough wife. I'm not a good enough friend or I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not strong enough. You are complete. You are perfect in God's eyes when you have Jesus. You have everything you need. Now, here's the kicker. You can reject that. You can reject that and try and do it on your own. And then you're not complete. But in Christ, you have the fullness. What we offer in the gospel 
is what this text represents. It's the hidden treasure. As Christians, what we offer is transformation. What we offer is something, something that's new. How many of you guys like going to get new shoes? Uh, sort, of. sort of? Okay. How many of you guys like going to get anything new? Okay, good. How many of you adults like, like a brand new pair of socks, brand new pair of shoes, brand new phone, brand new computer, brand new house, brand new car, brand new steak? I'm trying to get all of you involved. <laughs> all right. Brand new Sunday where the elders dance on stage. Like, you love that stuff. What we offer is transformation, something made brand new. That's what Christianity offers. That's what the story of the Scriptures, Jesus on every page, offers is transformation through faith in Jesus Christ. From death, kids, to life. That's what baptism is. When we accept Jesus and the hope that He offers, that He died on the cross for our sins, we are offered transformation, and that's baptism. Adults, I want to give you an answer. If someone says, why Christianity? What does Christianity offer me? You can say Jesus Christ, but wait, there's more. I want to help you understand and be able to articulate to a friend or a family member or a neighbor or a coworker what you might say to them. Because in Christianity, we are offering peace because the Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And, and peace not relegated to only certain parts of your life, but peace and wholeness in your heart. We're offering the beginning and the end, the understanding of everything, of why is my life like this? What's going on with my world? We're offering understanding the beginning to the end because the Bible says that He is the Alpha and the Omega. Full understanding of the whole story. We're offering forgiveness of our sins for Jesus paid it all. And the penalty of those sins. Do you guys know when Jesus died on the cross, he took all of your sins, all your bad things, all of your lies, when you don't listen to your mom and you don't pick up and you have a bad attitude and all that kind of stuff, he took all those, he nailed it on the cross and he said, I'm going to die for those things. What we're offering is the gospel, true and total, complete triumph over Satan and all of his demons. And philosophy and science and paganism can do nothing to embellish that. So the next time somebody offers and asks the question, well, what does Christianity have to offer? What is the Bible? Why should I become a Christian? What is your answer? You can learn about God. And goodness. And goodness. Your dress is very pretty. And you can learn um, to um, like God. Like Him? Who died for you? The name is found in Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. And as the team comes up, we're going we're gonna to sing about this here in just a moment. We're going to sing about this hope. That's the person that Christianity has to offer. In Him, absolute, complete salvation. In Him, complete sufficiency. In Him, complete peace. Some of you, and I want to talk to the uh, like 13 and above right now. You can look the part like everything's great. You can pretend like life's perfect. You can laugh with your friends. You can do everything. But inside, when your head hits the pillow, you know you're miserable. You know there's something missing. You know that there, there's something not right in your life, and it's found in Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 16 says this. Out of His fullness, we have received grace. We have all received grace in place of grace that's already given. Listen to that again. Out of His fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace that's already given. Isn't that a great statement? That's like saying, here's dessert. And then 30 seconds later, I come and go, here's dessert. 
In Jesus, we have grace. The, the way the original language describes it is we have grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And so when you begin to think to yourself, I have done way too many things. I am unforgivable. I, I, I have asked God to forgive me so many times. He is going to give up on me. I have promised not to do this sin over and over and over. And here I am again. I'm a loser. I am worthless. I can't do this. The book of John tells us that out of his fullness, we have grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It just keeps going like the waves at the ocean. We have wave of grace over and over because he loves you. That's why we're called the royal priesthood. Because we get all the goodies. And the goodies is grace and mercy and forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 puts it this way. In Him we have unsearchable riches. Some of you are like, man, I accepted Christ, but this guy's got no riches. In Him we have unsearchable, invisible riches you can't see, but they are so wrapped around you. 1 Corinthians 3 says, All things belong to you, whether the world, he's good, whether the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you because you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Everything, I want you kids, look at me, we're almost done. Give me like 30 more seconds. Think of everything that's in heaven right now. Everything that's beautiful, everything that's powerful. Everything that's good, everything that's peaceful is given to you through Jesus. Adult friends in this room, everything you're looking for is found in Jesus. It's not found in a relationship. It's not found in an education. It's not found in a better job. It's not found in a bigger house. It's found in Jesus. You say, well, Brian, that sounds way oversimplifying things. It is. Oh, darn it. It's found in Jesus. So kids, adults, married, divorced, young, old, widowed, those of you whose life is going really well right now, those of you whose life really stinks right now, I want to implore you to pursue Him and Him alone. Run to Him and you will find this hidden treasure in Jesus that's more than just accepting Him as Lord and Savior. It's what comes with that. It's this beautiful hidden treasure. And so as we finish, we say where we started. Look at this verse, you guys. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And we are by faith in Him. Jesus is enough. Find Christ, kids. Find Christ. Find Him. Learn about Him. Know Him. And you will have everything that you've ever needed. From understanding dinosaurs to robots. To understand the beginning of all creation to the end. To understand your relationships. To understand your struggles. To understand your flaws. To understand why life is the way it is. Find Jesus. And you'll begin to understand why Jesus said on the cross that it is finished. Because it's complete. Because you are complete. And then, and only then in a relationship with Jesus, will you experience real love, real peace, real forgiveness, and eternity surrounded by the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we're going to sing about that. Because you know who's been good to you? You said it all morning. Yeah, he's been so, so good. Yes. 
He's been so, so good. Adults, this is why we take a month and pour into these kids because they need to be told this. Deuteronomy tells us over and over and over, talk about it, write about it, put it on your doorpost. When you eat and when you drink, when you sleep and when you get up, talk about Jesus. Jesus should be talked about all the time in your home so that their response is, uh, Jesus? Yes, we'll find the answer in Jesus. He loves us. He died for us, and he holds it all together. So would you all please stand? Let's pray, and then we're going to sing. Let's pray together, kids. Ready? So God, right now, we pause for just a moment and, and say thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that our hope is found in you. Thank you that peacefulness and forgiveness and mercy and laughter and love and gentleness is all found in you. Thank you that hope is found in you. Thank you that proper relationship and understanding is found in you. Thank you that morality and ethics and political views are found in you. Thank you that, that our proper opinions are found in you. Thank you that wholeness is found in you. You have been so, so good to us. You have never turned your back on us. And God, remind these kids that they can always, always trust you and that they are never alone. That they would never know a day of life without you. And would you erupt this ceiling with our praise being given back to you? It's in the name of Jesus that we pray that we've gathered and opened the scriptures. Please come and do your work, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.